Hey guys, what's going on? Coach Luca here with Coach Chris Toombs. And we are here to break down some, you guys have asked questions because I posted some of it in IG stories. You've seen my phone with showing the numbers and doing jumps and stuff like that. And you know, velocity-based training, that's what VBT stands for. And uh, Chris is definitely one of the foremost experts in the world on this. He, he talks about it, he presents on it. Uh, and more, more, most importantly, he uses it all the time to get results. And he's, he's the head strength coach of Seattle Seawolves. So obviously day in and day out using it with collision sports athletes, but he's been doing it for a long time. So what I wanted to kind of not only break down is what it is, um, how to use it, and like how actually how it comes into play for any coach. Uh, or if you're, like I said, if you're an end user to understand this better, to get more results for your performance training, even, and, and we'll dig into a little bit too, like if somebody wants to develop strength, muscle mass, uh, it's not like a one kind of one, one uh, trick pony as far as like, oh, this just helps you get faster. No, like it, it, there's more to it. And actually, I wanted to, you know, you wrote no single system and I, I wanted to start there. What, what do you mean by no single system when it comes um, to VBT? I just think from our point of view as, co as coaches, um, velocity-based training is just, for me, the key driver in designing um, training sessions and des designing programming that's going to improve coaching but also athlete outcomes. So what, what that means is, it's a bit like what you've just said, it's not a one-trick pony, it's working across the full force velocity curve in terms of developing all strength qualities and not just a lot of people equate velocity-based training with moving um, barbells quickly yep. versus actually moving a barbell across the full spectrum and, and inevitably there's a, there's a linear relationship between weights getting heavier and the bar speed slowing down. Slow down that's yeah. just that's yeah. a kind of an obvious one, but yeah. it's, it's, a real, it's a real obvious one. And arguably the best high value work that you can do is actually at the strength end of the continuum. And we'll talk about that as we go. But yeah, it's we're, about... We're, and it's, it's like sometimes I'll just like stop and unpack, I guess, and ask questions, because I think this is important to understand, right? Uh, it's like maximum strength is, is the glass, and all the properties inside of the glass are things like power, power, endurance, everything else. But like once you fill the water up, only way to, to get more water in is to get a bigger glass and get Absolutely. stronger. Absolutely, yeah. But, but we talked about this a little bit even previously. You know, there's a certain point in time where strength is it becomes a diminishing factor right like it, building more of it doesn't make sense no 100 percent. and i think that's the reality and, and the real high value for me when using um you know velocity based training there's a return on investment and there's a there's a time factor involved in most people whether you work in professional sport or whether you're a you're, you're coming to the gym to improve your athletic capabilities or just your everyday living we've only got a finite amount of time and we've also only got a finite amount of kind of um energy to produce the adaptations that we're trying to drive. So from our point of view as practitioners, it goes back to this time and time again. It's designing or you're using velocity-based training to improve coaching, to improve decision-making, to, to improve athlete outcomes. And I think that, that uh, you know, the main benefits for, for me are objective, which is using our velocity-based training devices to help guide, to help guide not primarily because you've also got to involve the athlete in this interaction as well. But also those subjective markers, you know, um, athlete intent, driving athlete intent, encouraging them to move, even when it's heavy, move with maximal intent under obviously technical competency yeah. as well. And also from our point of view, just driving competition in, in training groups so that we get athlete outcomes. I think those two things can't be ignored even if we're looking at objectivity as a main marker for us as coaches and helping us understand the mechanisms of, of driving adaptation and creating adaptation or creating the stimulus to, to drive that adaptation. But also, it is linking it to, to, to RPE. And, and if I ask you, Luca, how did 500 pounds feel? I have to, as a coach, take into consideration that what the numbers say on my interface also have to marry up with you told me it was an eight yeah. or a nine yeah. Yeah. then i've got to adjust my programming accordingly because i don't want to be the guy who breaks my athlete i yeah. want to be the asset manager i don't want to be the one who causes you know or, or contributes to athlete injury especially yeah. not in my performance environment where collision sport athletes are getting you know put in the face of danger every time they take the field and you've got 100 kilo men or 225 guys 225 pound plus guys smashing into each other yeah. and creating different types of stress for the athlete. Yeah. So that's where the high quality elements come through. And, and the, the two things that like even just, you know, doing a, a good chunk of VBT now, I, I, I can say, you know, the objective market. So this is what I, I like about it is because you don't, seeing, like seeing stuff, now there's feeling, right? Like there's days I come in and go like, this feels, I feel great, I'm jumping high, I'm, I'm feeling strong. Sometimes the numbers don't correlate necessarily, yes. but the numbers will tell you very, very 
no, you're fast today, you're, you're, you're stronger today, you're moving this at fa uh, yeah. faster speed, yeah. so on and so forth. And because of that, you can adjust rather than being like, I don't know, you know, and, and, and there's this whole part of it, people like me that like to go hard, right? To, to where it gives you legitimate feedback, like, no, like, listen, this is second, third session that your numbers are low, you're moving slow, like you are tired and you need to back off. Yep, absolutely. I think the feedback piece is very big. Um, there's, there's a ton of current research being driven by some guys in the UK, Australia, and, and here in the US. Um, I will name check them. You've got, you got Stephen Thompson, you've got Harry Dorrell in the UK, you've got Harry Banyard in Australia with uh, Jonathan Weekly who's doing some amazing work, and Brian Mann who's, who's here yep. in, the, in the US. But I think one of the key things, going back to no single system and designed to improve your coaching and athlete decision making, we can, on a day-to-day -day basis, assess your strength level today. And that's important because, as we know, human physiology is not as easy as I'm going to do 5x5 five yeah. five today, 5x3 five next week, 4x2 the week after, and I'm going to have this linear, Sounds good. This linear right. progression. Yeah. And ultimately, from our point of view, we've got to have a flexible framework written in pencil that's going to get modified day-to-day -day based on assessing your strength level for today. Yeah, so on, on, that, on that side of things, first of all, I said I'm going to take There's that so photo. many athletes in Rid the background just pencil. trying to make yeah, me laugh. It's unbelievable. <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> pathetic human. <laughs> but, that, you know, and, and that's one of the parts that I wanted to bring up is, is those objective markers where on a, you know, everybody, we talk about intuitive training and it, understanding, like, here's the program written in pencil. We're going to change it up. But this actually gives you, like, uh, a, a view of Here's what we should do today based on what's going on. Yeah. And the num number two thing is the intent part, yep. right? Very, very few people in training, uh, with athletes, but just in general, talk about intent. Uh, later on, we'll see what I'm doing to trap bar deadlift. Sure. We'll see some examples of yeah. uh, a so-so jump and then better intent, some motivation, some, like I said, the driving competition outputs. We'll see that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I love that because the rep is not a rep, right? Meaning. Hey, I can do my, my barbell bench press at a certain speed. You go like, no, no, listen, you're 0.3, like get it to 0.5 yeah. meters per second. And now I'm going faster yeah. and you're showing it to me. So my intent changes. And with that, I'm changing the training session and getting Absolutely. more out of it. Right? Yeah, no, you are. And also, I think from, from that point of view, we've also got to recognize that as coaches, if we dose appropriately with the correct loading, we'll drive the adaptation that we want and we'll, we'll obviously d deliver the stimulus that we need to create that adaptation. So if you are moving a bar at 0.3 meters per second, say for a, for a bench press, and we want you to be moving it at 0.5 because we want to develop a different strength quality. Moving the bar at 0.3 meters per second and moving the bar at 0.5 meters per second has an impact on the strength qualities you're trying to deliver. Yeah. So arguably, from our point of view as coaches and educating athletes, we need to know and we need to have an understanding of a sort of framework and a template whereby a specific velocity equates to a specific intensity and that's crucial for us as coaches so that we can dose appropriately so that we don't crush athletes so that that recovery element becomes um, you know, a key driver to adaptation which yeah. is obviously what we want. We need transfer from our training in, in my particular case and, and most of my kind of career has been in, in team sport and in, in preparation for an athlete using the gym to drive transfer to the on-field performance. So those are important elements for us. And going back to those, those key researchers that I named, the science now is validating that actually doing less with higher quality is actually creating better outcomes for our athletes. So from our point of view as team but sport and, and coaches. Every, and I, sorry to interrupt yeah. you on this one, but does that go on every uh, piece of the spectrum? Speed, strength, even like for instance, uh, things like muscle mass. Um, so yeah, yeah. So there's there's a little bit of a difference between muscle mass, but speed and strength. So yeah. so I know we might you know bump into yep. velocity loss at, at one point in time during this discussion. But if you're trying to develop a better athlete, which ultimately means running faster, jumping higher, having more resilience, if you can dose appropriately, you can actually get better results with half the training because recovering from the training stress is much faster if you dose appropriately. I know we're getting yeah, into yeah, the kind of yeah, underlying yeah. science of this, yeah. but that there lies the key. Doing less, but doing it with higher quality actually gives you that better, that better athlete outcome. Yeah. And that's where, again, this is such a high value piece of technology for me. Yep, yeah, perfect. And so I, I wanted um, on, on a couple of things. Um, actually, when, when we did the tests, right, the different, I, I want to kind of go through them just a little bit so uh, people understand. So what, uh, so what we did, we essentially uh, did different weights and determine like what is my max velocity. So we did uh, 115 pounds, 
185, uh, 255. Basically, we go up by 70 pounds per set on a trap bar. Um, and I, yeah, this, this is perfect. So, so we end up we end up profiling you across the full it's, it's, spectrum. It's basically high, little... high velocity loads at the top end, low low velocity as your load gets heavier. And we, we, we would stop at when once my uh, velocity was like 0.45? Was it 0 0.45? 0 0.45, yeah. Right. I mean, we want to basically we, uh, profile across the spectrum yep. whereby you start at high velocity and you end up getting to around 80 to 85% of, of an athlete's oh, one rep max. Right, so you're not yeah. really taking them anywhere near limit failure yep, or yep. technical breakdown if they've got an experience. Yep. And I think that's also just a side note for, for this point of view is that you've also got to assess going back to no single system, whether VBT and velocity-based training is actually applicable for your athlete population given a lot of different contextual information. So young, young athletes, for example, who, with all due respect, are not necessarily having high level of, uh, have a high training age, yep. they may not necessarily need this. One thing that they can get a lot out of is that is athlete education piece yeah. with intent, yeah. but also sometimes if, if, if ultimately they still need to develop maximum strength to progress, this may just be a little bit of noise in their training history yep. versus someone who's been exposed to good quality training for three to five years, for example. This will be a very applicable means of improving their, their strength qualities yep. and having high quality outputs every time they come to the gym. But, That's but, an important element, I think. But, yeah, so, so, so but taking like, for instance, the, the test, right? What, what it determines too is like, what are the properties you need to work on the most? Right? Absolutely. Because it gives yep. you the feedback of like yep. maximum strength, Strength, speed, speed, strength, maximum speed, yeah. power output, yeah. and going like, hey, like this is not great. This we need to bring this up. No, sure. Once again, yeah, it's like f real feedback of this Pro is what you're missing. Yeah, totally. You and profiling is an assessment piece that's going to really help. And I know we're going to do it a bit later on. Yep. Whereby the steepness of this, the steepness of this curve, this line graph, is going to have implications on which strength qualities are much um, are more required than others. Yep. And ultimately, the steeper the curve, the more maximum strength is going to be your limiter versus a, a more shallow curve, whereby maybe a mixed methods approach of strength, speed, speed, strength, and maximum strength is gonna be the, the kind of driver in your, in your programming uh, thinking and, and planning. Okay, and uh, what, one thing I do wanna to touch on just at least a little bit is because um, it's like somebody might say, okay, okay, but if, if I'm working on maximal strength or hypertrophy, like, okay, I'll give you an example. So let's take an example. If you got an athlete that's like, I need to put like, it's a collision sport, I gotta put on muscle mass, mm -hmm. right? How do you approach that? You know, maybe you're maintaining some properties, but you're going like, we're going into a phase where we're going to build muscle mass. So it's a hypertrophy goal sure. as, a, as a primary goal with yep. other things to maintain. Sure. How would you use VBT in that to, to kind of drive that programming, yeah. for instance, Okay, right? so you can still use your profiling as your yep. kind of uh, main, main marker and, ready, um, and main kind of template for actually prescribing load effectively. What you then need is using the interface, and I know a lot of the VBT devices now have um, a velocity loss metric. Yeah. So the difference between programming a set whereby an athlete's velocity loss is 20%, which is much more conducive to developing strength qualities, the, the nearer you go to 30, 40, even 50% velocity loss across a set, the more you're creating muscle damage, time under tension, and all those, all those traditional kind of principles of developing hypertrophy, which, you know, yep. time under tension, short recoveries, um, like I say, creating muscle damage. Yep. So you can use the VBT to guide you with regards to your quality of prescription using velocity loss as a marker and not necessarily the absolute speed at which you you, you decline in rim loss. Uh, That's uh, something again which we can we can explore much much more fully with kind of there's a there's a session in itself on, yeah, on we'll, be developing hypertrophy with velocity based training and, and, and we'll, alongside developing strength along. And, and we'll and we'll do that definitely. I, I wanted to ask you that I, I like that because the three main mechanisms for for I would say uh, building muscle right one is muscle tension so lift heavy weights two is muscle damage and VBT can actually help you tell where you're in that point, but kind of get the most out of it without crushing it. yourself again, too much, right? Again, it's almost the the kind of volume piece is important for, for building muscle, yes. right? Yeah. So again, this the velocity loss elements are gonna help you dose and almost dose get a better quality output without totally crushing. I know muscle damage is part of the kind of yeah. end process in terms of developing hypertrophy, but we still don't want to keep crushing athletes yeah. time and time again because there's enough stress in the bucket from, from life as well as training yeah. stress. So those kind of balancing acts are, are important. I think that this, this helps, you know, with some of the stuff that you're bringing up. 
the longevity of training and getting results, right? Yeah. It's like, how, how do you dose the right weight? Continue to progress, mm -hmm. but not get crushed, because the worst thing that you no. can do is like, if you, if you get injured, yeah. that, that's the worst thing when it comes to 100%. progress, right? And like I think it, whether you want to develop strength or whether you want to develop hypertrophy or whether you want to develop um, a combination of both, Frequency of training and consistency of training are going to be two drivers for success, yep. irrespective of whichever system you use. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that VBT can help us do is make better decisions so we're not keep on crushing, keep yeah, on crushing, because yeah. all keep on crushing does is either athlete injury, athlete illness, athlete unavailability, or, or general pop. General either way, high, yeah. frequency and consistency, this helps us make better decisions. So these key drivers or these key pointers here are, are crucial for us because that inevitably will allow us to do or couple training sessions together and, and I, do it more consistently and, and with better quality outcomes. And I think too, like, I, you know, what I, why I wanted to expose this to, you know, more people and more coaches specifically too is that it becomes a great tool in a toolbox that, you know, you can take in and out, but also go, you know, check your system and you actually be able to get feedback to go like, whoa, yep. I might be doing too much with my athletes sure. or my clients. Yeah. And, and kind of get see. assessing strength levels on any given day has massive implications on quality of training units but coupled yeah. together yeah. and that, that like even just that basis. even yeah. just even just you that, don't have to use heading. it extensively yeah you can just get a little bit of information that makes your programming better day in day out yeah awesome all right so what we're going to do is we're going to move over to the trap bar you're going to put me through some stuff so people see me jumping and uh, and busting some numbers and then connect the dots okay yeah. Yeah, no, so, so from our point of view now, we're gonna move on to, to profiling our athlete. In this case, it's Luca. I think one of the things we wanna demonstrate here really is, um, is working at the speed end of the continuum, not necessarily for this particular um, element and this particular uh, showcase, but we've also gotta recognize that using our profiling, we're talking about taking someone um, not quite to minimum velocity threshold, which we've obviously covered off during our, during our other board session, but we, we want to work the full spectrum of strength quality. So we're talking about um, speed strength at the high velocity end, 1.5 meters per second. Going back to the board work we did, I talked to you about um, trying to drive athlete intent and competition. I'm going to challenge Luca to move this bar with, with absolute technical competency at 1.5 meters per second. I'm going to try and drive that intent for my athlete. And all being well, he's going to be the guy who's going to showcase his um, his athletic qualities and give me the numbers that I'm after. If he doesn't give me the numbers I'm after, that's when we have to modify and manage the load if we're trying to develop that specific strength quality. And we work across the full spectrum in order to um, deliver the specific loadings that are going to develop those strength qualities within a certain bandwidth. And we'll obviously discuss that and, and, um, and also explore that further as we go. Okay, so I mean, essentially what you're, it's like, okay, you want me to perform at a certain velocity, try to get me there with intent, if you can't, we're going to modify it and change yeah. the load yeah. so that we can get into that intent. During training, yes, but during profiling, we're going to use fixed loads. I know that you can, you can trap bar 500 pounds. Yep. So for me, I'm going to basically look at specific loads that are evenly spaced across the spectrum. So that to start with, you're going to lift at 115. We're then going to go up in 70 pound increments until we end up being at around 450. That's going to give me a very good indication of where you sit along the spectrum so that we can load appropriately in our training sessions. For profiling, we use fixed loads and we never change those loads. Okay. What we want to do in the future is develop a program to the point where every single specific load that we use, you're moving at a faster velocity, which is an indication that you've got stronger in our program and effective. Okay. okay? All right, let's get it. So here we go. You're pretty familiar with the technique. Obviously, from our point of view as coaches, we want absolute technical perfection from our, from our athletes as well as focusing on moving the bar with maximal intent. Three, good. Three, good, yeah. Okay, so what we've got here, we've just asked Luca to perform a trap bar jump with maximal intent, and I've been trying to drive him at 1.5 meters per second. Right and then you can see right here on our, on our interface that his best rep of the day so far was at 1.18 uh, meters per second. The, the, the funny thing is that we've had a conversation before training and, and Luke has already expressed that he's pretty beat up. So I kind of mentally recognized that he wasn't gonna 
drive at 1.5 meters per if, second today. But if you put some money down. I'll but put, if, I'll but go. if, but yeah, we've got some other athletes in the building who may or Your may not. Just a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we've got athletes barracking. So what we're going to do? We're going to give we're going to give Luca another 40 seconds rest, and within the 90 second time frame, I'm going to ask him to do it again, and I'm going to ask him to give me just a little bit more athlete intent, a little bit more athlete endeavor, and see if he can get nearer to 1.5 meters per second. If he can't then that's gonna give me an indication that our session needs to be modified even from our second set of the session. So we can make minute or, or, or major adjustments based on the, the athlete's effort. So I think um, with, with some guy barricading in the corner, we're gonna be in a position to uh, actually yeah, hit nearer right 1.5. Right Here we go. Here we go. Explode. Give me let's some go, heat. Here we go. Let's rev it up. Let's rev it up. 198, see? Best 198, best rep of the day. So ultimately, yeah, he's, um, he's beat him from last week. But there, there lies also another factor to consider where we've got a small group or even a larger group of athletes in the building. A, a little bit of a rev up from, from someone in the, uh, in the talked about this the other day in too, the peanut <laughs> gallery. And uh, ultimately, the athlete who's on the, on the platform is giving athlete intent. If you get athlete intent, you get athlete output. If you get athlete output, you get athlete results. So arguably, using our objectivity and a little bit of coercion from our, our peer group is gonna actually allow us to, to drive some, some high quality adaptation. Now, okay, so... Chris Toombs is still a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're making life hard for us, buddy. <laughs> so, from, so if, we, if we look at, okay, now, now we're, we're driving maximum, like basically speed strength here, right? Yes. What, so let, let's go and talk about strength. I mean, for, for a lot of folks, obviously, to have different, I don't know, for an athlete, a lot of times we, we want to develop strength, we want to develop speed, maybe we want to put on some muscle. Let's say somebody, if we shift those goals a little bit, meaning uh, somebody's like, hey, I want, to, I want to build maximum strength, right? How does that now determine this force curve and where do we want to be and how does that look like? No, absolutely. So I think one of the things about this particular um, technology is, is not just gathering data, it's actually building an intervention off the data you gather. So just recently I've profiled two athletes yep. and from, from this profiling um, line and the, the steepness or, or lack of, of the, of the drop off from high velocity to, to low velocity and the maximum strength element, the, the steeper this curve, for example, MVT, just quickly, MVT is pretty much for 99% of people the same irrespective of your strength level. So understanding where max, uh, minimum velocity threshold is, the place that you're hitting technical and, and ultimately you know, failure, yep. is the same whether you can hex bar deadlift 500 pounds or 300 pounds. And that's, you, you were explaining, that's yeah. based on research and that's studies that shows. A, a hun hundreds and hundreds of athletes being you know, profiled across the spectrum of the strength qualities we need okay. across all those, you know, the squat, the deadlift, the hex bar deadlift, the bench press, the main big, the big rocks, the yep. main big rocks. But arguably, so here, the, the, the steeper this curve, or the steeper this, sorry, this, this line on this graph, the greater the need for this particular athlete to develop maximum strength versus this athlete who may need more strength speed or more high velocity work, depending on where their training exposure generally happens. So there's a lot of people who say a powerlifting population, they work a lot at the, um, at the maximum strength end of the curve because that is their sport. Yep. Whereas for an athlete population, we might want more, um, they still need to develop or at least maintain maximum strength, but they also need other strength qualities. So again, going back to my population, my rugby guys need to be shifting 100 kilo men, 225 men with maximum force as quickly as possible. So they may need to develop more strength speed with an underlying capacity of maximum strength because they need to be able to essentially drive their rate of force development up. Now, because when me and you come into a combat situation or a collision situation, the faster I can apply force onto you, the more I should hopefully win collision dominance. Yes. Yeah. That's the game or yeah. some of the game. So you, I mean, you're essentially what you're looking at is looking at the game and what, what that game needs. It could be the game of life. And so because I'm obviously, a, I'm a big fan. I mean, I've done all types of different programming, but you know, for example, I, if, you know, having strength days, for example, yeah. maximal strength yeah. days. And now we can look at the curve and be in that 
uh, was it 0 0.4, 0 0.4 range? Yeah, uh, anyway, anywhere, anywhere from 0 0.5 meters per second and down is gonna develop maximum strength. So, so for example, right, that's, that's uh, something to think about is like, 0.045 to 0.5, like you're working on strength. And then we have these different parameters to develop yeah. different things. Absolutely. And, yep. and then we have, to, you know, today's a strength day, for instance, for, for Luke, or to, you know, tomorrow will be like a speed day for me. And so, yep. so now we develop these properties and we look at where we want to be. Exactly. Does that also determine, because this is, a, you know, once somebody, if I say, okay, I'm doing five sets of five, right? But I get so smoked, I either have to change the load right, or terminate the sets, because it's, it's on a daily basis helping you know how much volume you should even be doing. Absolutely, so again, going back to, I mean, there's other concepts that we're gonna be able to discuss, but there's, a, there's reps in reserve is one thing that's important, which ties in with kind of athlete RPE, yep. and, and, and it also ties in with a specific velocity. So if, for example, I ask you to develop maximum strength within a, within a set on the hex bar deadlift, yep. And with, with obviously your athlete intent, you're giving me you know, good quality output. And if your, last, if your last rep of your set of five is at 0 0.05 meters per second, that tells me as a coach, because I know where the spectrum lies, you're, you're still four reps away from max effort. So what that essentially equates to is that you've got four reps in reserve if your last rep is at 0.5 meters per second. So if your last rep's at 0.5 meters per second, one thing that's happened is that we haven't programmed your loading appropriately because it's ultimately too light. Too light because yeah. we need 0 0.5 and below to give you the stimulus or drive the stimulus and the adaptation that you're after. But there's a secondary part of this, which is another thing that's been built around um, some of the main research in this area, which is velocity loss. And what velocity loss tells you across the set is how fatiguing each individual set is and how that then will couple up against other exposures to strength training, going back to your accessory lifts, that impact massively on how today's training session is gonna impact on tomorrow's training session and your recovery to go again, whether it's on a field-based training session, whether it's a speed session, whether it's a second you know, upper body weight training session, for example. So all of these things are starting to paint a big picture around what you do today impacts on what you can do tomorrow, impacts on what you can do the next day. Yep. And also then the bigger picture things are, is developing maximum strength your priority? Well, if it is, because this is your, this is your line on the graph, if that's your priority, then we have to spend much more time in this sweet spot. And if you're an athlete who needs to develop much more sort of strength, speed and speed strength, you're then spending much more time in this part of the curve, which ultimately means you're starting to move moderately heavy weights at say 0.7, my best riding, 0.7 to 0.9 meters per second, but you cannot, you cannot neglect the maximum strength end of the continuum. You just have to do a minimum effective dose. Might be two sets, might be one set. Because one set, one set at 0.4 meters per second over three reps, Sorry, this is absolutely horrendous writing. <laughs> one, one set at 0.4 may be the specific dose that you need today to just, to, maintain. to just maintain maximum strength, but then you're driving, you're driving all of these other velocities at, at moderate load up and to the right on your curve. So when we come to profile again, we know that your programming has been successful because you've dosed the maximum strength, which is, a, it is important, but you've also spent more time working speed, strength, and strength speed, which is an area of neglect for a lot of athletes. So I want to focus here all the time. And I want to bring this up. I think for athletes and for anybody that wants to get stronger, because there's, I mean, uh, great examples. I, I can't remember when I was reading this, but uh, somebody that was working on their strength speed, right? So they, ne they actually never touched their maximal loads uh, for 12 weeks, you know, came back and PR on their maximal lift. You know, and most people don't think in those terms, like, oh, well, if I'm not lifting heavy enough, I can't get stronger. But the strength speed was was basically carrying over to the maximum yeah. strength, because once again, mass is, is force times acceleration, right? So it's like, it, I mean, or should I say force, right? It's mass times acceleration. So they were able to get their force output up. Yeah, right? but also if you've spent years and years working at the maximum strength end of the continuum, yeah. The lag, the lag time we're actually taking 12 weeks off and still developing the other strength qualities, there's, there's a lag time that can catch up. Mm -hmm. 
and I mean I, I can't remember exactly Verkashansky's work for every for every 12 weeks of maximum strength there should be 12 weeks of you know special strength in order for that 12 weeks of maximum strength block to almost catch up gotcha. so you've got so if you are spending a lot of time here there's every chance that when you actually unload from really really heavy lifting that super compensation is actually going to take the same amount of time that you so take off it, yeah. to develop that or to to, to kind of get to the get to the lag point which is yeah this this all moving up and to the right but i would suggest in the, in the modern day with athlete populations we have to dose even if it's very very um minimally at the maximum strength end if they've a, a kind of what i'd call um you know normal profile like they're, they're strong but they're not you know the 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 challenge we have as, as especially strength coaches in, in team sport is that the, the rate of diminishing returns or return on investment. If someone can hex bar dead 500 pounds, is there much work or is there much point in us Trying to getting get... them to 550 versus let's move 500 even faster, yep. which yep. is technically getting stronger because that's another benefit Correct. of, of yep. VBT. Yep. You are moving a fixed load 500 pounds faster now than you were six weeks ago. Your program has been effective. And that's, and that's progress that people don't look at. Correct. But could, yeah, it's the same huge. weight, but you're moving it faster. Yeah. That is, again, one of the key benefits of VBT. You're actually allowing someone to lift sub-maximally, but showing you as a coach that they're getting stronger because I'm now lifting 500 faster. Yeah. And that's, that's a win. And obviously in sport, that's a win because we want these qualities all to transfer onto the field. I love this. So, yeah. I mean, First, first of all, if you guys, uh, I would say this, if you want more of this, like we're gonna, we're gonna put the other whole course around it, like deep dive into like, how to use this and programming, testing, everything else. If you guys are around Vigor, drop in, you know, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll do some of this on you. Uh, by the way, subscribe to the channel because that way you're gonna get more of this content uh, with smart guys like this that need to work on their writing a little bit. <laughs> but, but, but like I said, because once again, you know, it's the modalities and sometimes it's just taking some of this and you don't have to, uh, like for example, you know, you could integrate some of this and get a lot of benefit. Like I, I use it on my dynamic effort days for upper and lower body uh, and it's been great. And, and once again, I'll tell, I'll tell you what, you know, it's a big, big thing. And we've experienced that pretty quickly is how much more of a, a great environment it can create amongst and it, it can be athletes but just people training together because you get that challenge you get absolutely the push, yeah you get obviously uh, the shit talking from uh from people and yeah what it does is it it just gets like it gets you more output it just the does. human it, the human element of this is is output yeah and ultimately it's driving intent and it's driving athlete competitiveness yeah. or even even the general pop yeah. and also you never waste a rep because if you do have if you do have it done well and if you program effectively you never waste a rep and that does take a time to get yourself to that position sure. but there lies you know the return on investment you're training with high quality all of the time awesome so make i make sure you follow chris on ig we'll put his tag on below this is going to also push him to put out more stuff because he's a really smart guy that knows his stuff <laughs> somewhat of a legend too so it's like i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge him and push him to put out more stuff but once again hey be, be on the lookout we're gonna like put in put a whole course together about this so you can help help you guys out no matter what like if you're a coach definitely if you're a coach i mean that's the main uh, process how can you get tools that are simple and you have a framework to help you uh train athletes better train general population better get feedback create a better environment create a better culture uh, of competitiveness positive competitiveness uh and of course everybody wins so Thanks for